Chapter 36, The Transfiguration The faith of the disciples was greatly strengthened at the Transfiguration when they were permitted to behold Christ's glory and to hear the voice from heaven testifying to His divine character. God chose to give the followers of Jesus strong proof that He was the promised Messiah, that in their bitter sorrow and disappointment at His crucifixion they should not entirely cast away their confidence. At the Transfiguration the Lord sent Moses and Elijah to talk with Jesus concerning His sufferings and death. Instead of choosing angels to converse with His Son, God chose those who had themselves experienced the trials of earth. Elijah had walked with God. His work had been painful and trying, for the Lord through him had reproved the sins of Israel. Elijah was a prophet of God, yet he was compelled to flee from place to place to save his life. His own nation hunted him like a wild beast, that they might destroy him. But God translated Elijah. Angels bore him in glory and triumph to heaven. Moses was greater than any who had lived before him. He had been highly honored of God, being privileged to walk with the Lord face to face as a man speaks with a friend. He was permitted to see the bright light and excellent glory that enshrouded the Father. The Lord through Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Moses was a mediator for his people, often standing between them and the wrath of God. When the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled against Israel for their unbelief, their murmurings, and their grievous sins, Moses' love for them was tested. God proposed to destroy them and to make of him a mighty nation. Moses showed his love for Israel by his earnest pleading in their behalf. In his distress he prayed God to turn from his fierce anger and forgive Israel or blot his name out of his book. When Israel murmured against God and against Moses because they could get no water, they accused him of leading them out to kill them and their children. God heard their murmurings and bade Moses smite the rock that the people might have water. Moses smote the rock in wrath and took the glory to himself. The continual waywardness and murmuring of the children of Israel had caused him the keenest sorrow, and for a little time he forgot how much the Lord had borne with them and that their murmuring was not against him, but against God. He thought only of himself, how deeply he was wronged, and how little gratitude they manifested in return for his deep love for them. It was God's plan to bring often his people into straight places, and then in their necessity to deliver them by his power, that they might realize his love and care for them, and thus be led to serve and honor him. But Moses had failed to honor God and magnify his name before the people, that they might glorify him. In this he brought upon himself the Lord's displeasure. When Moses came down from the mount with the two tables of stone and saw Israel worshiping the golden calf, his anger was greatly kindled, and he threw down the tables of stone and broke them. I saw that Moses did not sin in this. He was wroth for God, jealous for his glory. But when he yielded to the natural feelings of his heart and took to himself the honor which was due to God, he sinned. And for that sin, God would not suffer him to enter the land of Canaan. Satan had been trying to find something wherewith to accuse Moses before the angels. He exulted at his success in leading him to displease God, and he told the angels that he could overcome the Savior of the world when he should come to redeem man. For his transgression, Moses came under the power of Satan, the dominion of death. Had he remained steadfast, the Lord would have brought him to the promised land and would then have translated him to heaven without his seeing death. Moses passed through death, but Michael came down and gave him life before his body had seen corruption. Satan tried to hold the body, claiming it as his, but Michael resurrected Moses and took him to heaven. Satan railed bitterly against God, denouncing him as unjust in permitting his prey to be taken from him. But Christ did not rebuke his adversary, though it was through his temptation that the servant of God had fallen. He meekly referred him to his father, saying, The Lord rebuke thee. 
Jesus had told his disciples that there were some standing with him who should not taste of death till they should see the kingdom of God come with power. At the transfiguration this promise was fulfilled. The countenance of Jesus was there changed and shone like the sun. His raiment was white and glistening. Moses was present to represent those who will be raised from the dead at the second appearing of Jesus. And Elijah, who was translated without seeing death, represented those who will be changed to immortality at Christ's second coming and will be translated to heaven without seeing death. The disciples beheld with astonishment and fear the excellent majesty of Jesus and the cloud that overshadowed them, and heard the voice of God in terrible majesty, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him.